Preamps can have a transformer on the input, but not microphones. So microphones typically, in simplistic terms, you've got a capsule that's connected to either a JFET or a tube, okay? Right. Sometimes there's a capacitor in between, sometimes not. So the transformer would be on the output. So the three circuit topologies are transformerless JFET, transformer JFET, and transformer tube. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. Sending your music to be mastered can be scary, but sending your music to a total stranger for mastering can be really scary. Chris Graham is a billboard chart breaking mastering engineer with thousands of credits and knows how to make your record sound fantastic. But more importantly, he understands that there is one person that really knows what a great record sounds like, and that's you, rock stars. So if you're thinking about hiring professional mastering, but not sure if it's right for you, go to chrisgrammastering.com and get a free sample mastering of your song. Go find out just how great your record can sound at chrisgrammastering.com. Just click the link included in the show notes. Hey, rock stars! it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Matt McGlynn, the founder of Roswell Pro Audio, a boutique microphone company from the wine country of Northern California. His goal is to make microphones that provide a distinctive sound, but also a level of performance normally associated with far more expensive devices. You've heard our sponsor ads on the podcast about the Roswell Mini K47 and the Delphos mics, both of which are really cool, well-built microphones at affordable price points. Matt also runs RecordingHacks.com, home of the well-known Recording Hacks microphone database, which is an ongoing attempt to document every microphone ever made. If you want to learn more about all sorts of microphones, how they work, it's the perfect place to start. Remarkably, Matt is not afraid to give detailed reviews to other microphone brands as well, which is a true testament to just how good the Roswell mics are as part of the pack. In fact, within a few minutes on the site, I learned a ton about many new mics when I was visiting. Matt also runs MicrophoneParts.com, a company that began by selling upgrade kits for cheap microphones and currently sells premium studio microphones in DIY kit form. So if you enjoy DIY projects in the studio, then I know you're going to love RecordingHacks.com, MicrophoneParts.com, and both the sound quality and mission of Roswell Pro Audio. Today, Matt is going to share with us his strategy on how to build a mic locker, which will work for the pro or home studio through a system of categorizing condenser mics that should help you intelligently build diversity into your collection and avoid buying a bunch of microphones that sound more or less the same. I'm very excited to have Matt McGlynn joining us in Recording Studio Rockstars. Matt, my friend, are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. <laughs> nice, dude. So, um, again, it's it's an honor to have you here on the show. Thank you also for being a sponsor of the podcast. That really means a lot to me and, and all the rock stars listening because it's how we are able to uh, keep doing this, too. So we really appreciate it. And what a wonderful sponsor to have. Oh, well, thank you. And thanks for having me on. You know, as far as sponsorship goes, I'm happy to do it. What you're doing is just fantastic. I mean, the amount of content that's out there for people who are coming up and getting into this amazing field of, of music production is astounding. And it's thanks to people like you who spend a lot of, you know, let's be honest, uncompensated time seeking out experts in the field and cajoling them and convincing them to come on the show and give up all their secrets so that your listeners can benefit. I think that's fantastic. Well, thanks, man. I, I like that you use the word cajoling. I think that's a first for a hundred and however <laughs> many episodes this is. <laughs> all right. 
So, um, you know, and of course, I feel like I'm standing in the company of an originator. How long have you been doing recording hacks and microphone parts? It's been a while, right? It has been a while. In fact, I just looked up recording hacks history over the weekend, and the 10th anniversary is in February. So we're looking at nine and a half years or so this far. Wow. Wow. That's pretty intense. Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, your background and how you got into this stuff. If you want to start with recording or if you want to start with, you know, why and how you started to put so much effort into this free resource or a couple of free resources out there on the Internet. Sure. Yeah. So um, my background is as a musician. I've been playing drums my entire life. And I started collecting microphones in college, which is a lot, a lot longer ago than I'd care to admit. And before I was attempting to do home recording. In fact, when I started buying microphones, home recording wasn't really a thing. I, I guess people maybe had four tracks. I don't know. It was a long time ago. And But then when home recording became pretty viable and you could buy a digital audio card, um, mm -hmm. Audio Media 2, that name comes to mind. Yeah. It was an old DigiDesign product. So you could do lightweight recording at home, probably two channel. I started buying microphones and that is what really started the snowball rolling because... I started listening to mics and and hearing what they sounded like, and it was shockingly different from one to the next. And I realized there's really something there where this this device that you hang on the stand above the drum kit massively influences the sound that you get out of it. And yeah, you can talk about drums and room and heads and sticks and how hard you hit and how you hit. But the truth is, if you've got a crap microphone up there, it doesn't matter because yeah. you're going to get a terrible result. And conversely, if you get something that sounds really good, then everything, just everything gets better. And, and what's great about that is, you know, practice is key, of course, having great, a great instrument and a great room and great technique. These are all really critical, but anybody can buy a microphone. And if you can buy something that sounds better, why wouldn't you? Do you, you just think, have to find the one that sounds better. Yeah. Do you think that you were more inclined to be interested in the microphones as a drummer than if you had been playing any other instrument? Or do you think it was just in your nature to be fascinated by the sound of the microphones, no matter what you were doing with them? That is a good question, and I, I don't have an answer to that because I don't have any basis for comparison. What I noticed was that some microphones sounded great and other ones sounded funky, and they just colored and thin and two-dimensional, you know, n no, no bass information in the overheads and that sort of thing. So I just noticed that the microphones that I didn't like didn't sound good and didn't sound like my drums. So I, maybe it was, you know, maybe it would, that would have been true for any, any instrument I played. It, it is my nature to be a little bit meticulous about things. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, now I know that you've got a few microphones out in your line of mics for Roswell Pro Audio. Do you sort of envision anything drum specific? Do you, do you sort of envision sort of a complete drum recording line of microphones at some point? Or uh, is, it, is it too early to ask that question? It's with this, I can only tell you for now, no, we don't. Here's the peculiar thing that I've learned about building microphones. It's relatively easy to build a condenser microphone. It's, and even though dynamic microphones, which are typically what's used for drums, even though those are simpler devices, in fact, often it's just literally a capsule in a housing, sometimes a transformer, sometimes not, but there's no circuit there. So all, all this conversation that you see online about capacitors and resistors and diodes and transistors and tubes and so on, none of that matters in dynamics. Yeah. Because there aren't any of those things. So what a lot of companies do is they open a Chinese catalog and they, they see someone who makes a bunch of moving coil cartridges and they say, I'll take that one and put it in this shape of housing. I'll take that one. And that's my kick drum mic and blah, blah, blah. Some, of course, do a much nicer job of design than that. But for some, it's as easy as putting, you know, picking a logo and a shape I just, I don't have any interest in that. I mean, if I can't build something great, I'm not going to build it at all. At this moment, I don't have the knowledge to design a fantastic dynamic drum mic. So at the moment, I'm not planning on that. Now, overheads and maybe kick are a different thing because there are condenser sorts of solutions for those that we're looking at. But uh, at the moment, it's not really a priority. Yeah, um, you know, I, gosh, what is it? Is it an Altec? I, I, I feel uh, dumb for not remembering the model number, but I do have a condenser mic that I sometimes use for snare. It's an older one. But one of the things that I remember seeming to make it work is that it had a very low level. So I think it, <laughs> it, it, could, it could withstand the high SPL of somebody smacking a snare drum right in front of it. Yeah, no, that's, that's actually key. Most of the microphones that I've designed have pretty high sensitivity. 
and that's because I hate noisy vocal tracks. Yeah. I hate listening to a voiceover <laughs> or a sung vocal where I hear hiss in the background. So we've intentionally created the Roswell mics to have relatively high sensitivity because that's one of the ways that you beat noise. Yeah. But if you put one of my vocal mics on a snare drum, it's, you know, it might clip the mic or might not, but it'll for sure clip your preamp. So yeah, for snare drum, you want something with much lower output. Um, now the Delphos has got a pad right on the mic. And I know that one of the nice things about plugging in a mic that's hot, especially when you first get it, is it just sort of sounds more exciting to you. You know, when you put them on, turn up the mic pre a little bit and, and hear it in the phones or the speakers. What are some things that are, I, I know I'm sort of leaping into questions here, but what are some things that are important about putting a pad on a mic, if you want to have a, a mic that has a low noise floor and, and maybe therefore a hot level, but making sure that the pad really works well and doesn't somehow degrade the mic signal. Is that something worth talking about? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think it's not that complex. Typically, what the way pads work is they reduce the input voltage. And so you get less voltage coming out, which is to say less signal coming out. What goes hand in hand with that, though, is that circuit noise is a constant. It, it, it is what it is, and certainly you can lower it if you use a good design and really good components and so on. But whatever noise noise level you end up with in your circuit, it's going to be there regardless of your input voltage. So if you pad the input voltage way down or pad the input level way down by switching in a 20 decibel pad, for example, that means that your noise floor is effectively 20 decibels higher because you have to turn up the volume mm -hmm. on your preamp. Now, if you're recording a, a snare drum, that's okay because you don't have to turn the preamp gain up because that 120 decibel rim shot that comes through is going to come through. <laughs> right, no problem <laughs> the noise there. <laughs> floor is, yeah, the noise floor is just fine. So that's, that's kind of the trade-off. It is a viable solution. You know, you build a mic with hot output or high output and it's great for vocals and acoustic nylon string guitar and, you know, spoken word or voiceover, stuff like that that's very quiet. But then you turn the, the giant pad on and then you can stick it in front of a kick drum. So that, that is a viable solution, and it's certainly one that we're looking at. Would the Mini K47 or the Delphos, what would it do if I put it on a snare drum or close to a snare? It wouldn't hurt the microphone in any way. It, like I said, it, it might clip the mic depending on how loud the person plays, mm -hmm. and it, it almost certainly will clip your preamp, which again doesn't do any harm. What some customers do is they put an inline pad between the mic and the pre. Or if the preamp has a trim control or a built-in pad, sometimes that helps. Yeah. Well, I know sometimes um, using a condenser mic can sound pretty great getting in close to a drum kit, depending on how somebody's playing, too. So I bet those would sound awesome. I was using the Delphos recently for my guitar recording. So I had, you know, I had amps, heads in the control room, and we were running a speaker cable out to a cabinet in the live room, and then doing a few different mics and sort of doing a blend of uh, the Delphos. And I think maybe I had an SM57 and I may have put up a ribbon and I don't remember if I used that much, but it sounded great. It, was, it, it does that wonderful thing of adding sort of a 3D quality to the sound. It sort of, it, it adds deeper lows and it adds more clarity to just the picture, to the sound, you know? And it's so much fun to be able to blend mics like that when you're recording guitars. Yeah, a condenser mic will do that for you. You'll definitely get deeper lows and a different kind of high end. You get a lot more detail uh, out of a condenser. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's, and, and blending is, is good too, because then you get different textures out of a single session. I also noticed that when you add a condenser like that to, you know, a distorted or a rock guitar sound, and if, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm running that blended down to mono and going through my 1176 or a compressor, is it helps to give that rush of sound that comes after a power chord, for example. You know, you play a tight power chord, and as the chord stops, when you get a great sound mic'd up, you, you almost feel like this low-end rush that comes forward after the, the power chord. So that's one of my fav favorite little details. <laughs> great, yeah. So tell us about getting into this, you know, recordinghacks.com and microphone parts. I mean, I guess you got fascinated by microphones as a musician, and you started to learn how to do this. What do you want to tell people who think they might be fascinated by how microphones work? Should they, you know, do you advise them to go down that road or do you tell them to turn around and go home while they still have a chance? You know, what's... <laughs> Yeah. Um, it sounds like it would be, it's, it sounds like there's this m mysterious zone inside a microphone. Like that's only for the experts, you know? 
uh, that's less and less true. And I, I, one of the really interesting things that I've seen over the past five or six, seven years is that do-it-yourself audio has gone from being kind of a fringe thing that a couple of nerdy people do to being a very mainstream activity. And I think that's great. I think especially for people who are starting out and still have some time and you know don't necessarily have the responsibilities of families to support and this sort of thing. Learning how to solder and build your own gear is without doubt the best way to build up a studio. Uh, why is that? Because you will pay 20 to 30 cents on the dollar for comparable gear. Okay, so mm. what that means is you can buy a kit to build a preamp. There's a lot of preamps I know. There's compressors that I know of. Uh, of course, there's microphones, so you can buy these kits, and they come in all different styles. I mean, some you get a bag of non-distinguished parts in a schematic, and, a, and you know, good luck, and you have to fend for yourself. And other ones, it's really laid out step by step. And if you can read and you can solder, then you can end up with a completed product, and it works when you fire it up the first time, which is one of the best feelings in the world. You know, you've yeah. just spent some number of hours building this thing, and you're filled with trepidation and you plug it in and you're like, oh, is this going to work? And you fire it up and you hear yourself and it sounds great. You think, oh my God, not only does it work, but it actually sounds really good. So there's a huge reward there, you know, in, in the making and the doing, but also in the financial savings. Yeah. Um, uh, it's funny. You're, you're conjuring up a memory for me of being on a long family car trip and dad got me one of those Radio Shack kits, electronic DIY kits. And I sat there for hours trying to assemble some kind of radio broadcasting device that was supposed to broadcast whatever I said into the car stereo, you know, of a car driving <laughs> next to us on the highway. <laughs> and I great. did the whole thing and I got it all going, you know, there I am turning it on and turning the knobs and absolutely nothing's happening. You know? oh. So it's encouraging to know that, you know, um, your approach to this is to offer a, a strategy and a kit where when you finish it, it's actually going to work, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And there's, there's a number of companies uh, who do it. Um, a lot of people in your audience probably know Peterson Goodwin at DIY Recording Equipment. And they make uh, the color kit is the thing most that he's best known for. It's basically a, a device where you basically run your, your master bus into it and it's EQ or compression or tube saturation. or It's like a the color characteristics of a vintage pre or a vintage compressor. So it doesn't do the compression. It just gives you the flavor of the transformers that happen to be in that compressor. That's, that's, that's the super idea. cool. What's the name of that and, one again? And Peterson, if you're listening, and I've just butchered your idea, forgive me, but <laughs> doing the best I can. It's DIY recording equipment. DIYRE.com is, I think, what it is. Okay. Um, anyway, the reason I mentioned him is because he's, I mean, he's got a, a, a neat product, but also for at least some of his stuff, he has a, some kind of build guarantee, I believe. And again, don't quote me on this because it's not my product, but I believe he has some kind of program where if you build it and it doesn't work, they'll take care of you. They'll fix it for you or something yeah. like that. So check that out. So the, there's a safety net for some of these things. Yeah. The guarantee is if you suck at this, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that, that's a hard thing for DIY providers because there are unfortunately people who have no business with a soldering iron in their hand. They just fall in love with the fact that they're saving 80% of the cost of the product. Right. And they buy it and they butcher it and then they expect you to bail them out. And you think, well, you've just consumed $150 worth of components that I can't salvage, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's hard for, you know, the people who are making preamps or, you know, my company that does the DIY microphone stuff. It's just hard sometimes. We do the best we can. Don't want to leave anyone hanging. It's not good for us if someone's out there saying, yeah, I built it and it didn't work. That's bad for us. And we try to prevent that. But sometimes there are people who just, you know, Nice. It's, well, it's hard. They make it hard. <laughs> we'll do a shout out, rock stars. When you email support for your DIY product, um, be considerate. Be considerate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The people who are nice get better treatment. I mean, we're all human, you know. That's funny. Well, um, let's talk about that. You know, the, the fascination with DIY soldering. When I was going to school, I loved that stuff. I remember one of my projects... Um, I remember a Saturday morning, I went, like got up at 6 a.m., and I, which, of course, was a big deal when I was that age. <laughs> but, hey, it's still a big deal. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I broke out my rat pedal, my distortion pedal, and I took the thing apart, and I sat there with a pencil and a paper, and I completely reverse engineered the whole thing. I drew out the entire schematic, which it's not that complex of a circuit. But at that time, it, you know, when you're starting out, it seems pretty damn complex. 
But, you know, I remember being so excited by trying to figure this stuff out and figuring out where the caps were. And then I, I swapped them out with bigger caps and I took a Sharpie and I crossed out the R and I called it the fat pedal. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was that process of like beginning to understand this stuff and taking a soldering iron. And I was always pretty handy. So I enjoyed building models as a kid and things like that. But I think, you know, many of us do really enjoy the process of, you know, learning how to craft and craft something well. I mean, if, even if we're recording music, we're trying to craft it well. If we're mixing, we're trying to craft it well. Building cables, building components and, and equipment has that same quality to it. But there is something, and, and you and I talked about this earlier, that is a little bit of a challenge because there's a part of me now, 25 years later, that wants to re-embrace that hobby, you know, and, and getting into the stuff. But when I do sit down to solder, I am frustrated pretty quickly because I realize I can't see what the hell I'm doing. So I thought I'd ask you to give us, um, especially as we have a lot of listeners that are older too, give us some insights into how we can re-embrace this, this fascination with building things and using a soldering iron. Yeah, that's a great question, actually. The reason I like that question is because I my eyes are awful. I've been wearing glasses since second grade and they're they're heavy duty. I mean, I'm I'm pretty blind. I, I asked my optometrist years ago what my vision was, you know, 2020, 20, 2040, and he laughed. And I said, that's what's funny. That's not a good sign. And he said, you're kind of off the chart. We, we would just say 2600. <laughs> but the 600 is a stand in for like 1200 because we, we don't have numbers that go that high. And I'm not an optometrist, but that was the gist of it was that I'm blind. I'm, I'm nearsighted, you know, to a significant fault. And if not for modern physics and chemistry and whatever they need to make contact lenses and glasses, I'd be the village idiot because I can't see anything. So wow. part two of this story is that I came to this relatively late in life. I did not grow up building Heath kits and stuff. I started soldering within the past 10 years. Wow. Uh, the good news is if I can do it, anybody can do it, uh, especially given my um, fairly real visual handicap. Your, so, your proclivity for not seeing well? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard, especially with contact lenses. My focal distance is about six inches. I can't see anything closer than five or six inches when I have my contacts in, which means, and that's too far for me to resolve the part numbers on resistors. Hmm. So I literally cannot read them unless I take out my contacts and I hold the thing up an inch from my eyeball. It's awful, but it's, it works. So the number two most valuable tool for DIY audio, number one being a soldering iron, number two is a magnifying glass. I mean, here's the thing. Resistors are the size that they are. And they have numbers printed in a size that has to fit on there. We had a customer complain a couple of years ago about the small model numbers on these resistors. And he, he gave the kid a, like a two-star review because the parts were so small. And I was just like, I mean, <laughs> what choice do I have? We don't make resistors here. You know? <laughs> well, Nobody I think makes their own resistors. That's crazy. You buy the good ones that are great for audio and they happen to be small because that's what these things are. Right, right. Well, I think um, even the learning the color bands, I would probably have trouble seeing the color bands now, you know. True. Yeah, the color bands are a, are a pain because the jacket color seems to bleed through sometimes. I, I struggle with color bands. Most of our resistors are Dale, Vichy Dale, and they don't have color bands. They're coffee colored and they have a number printed on it and you can just read it. If you've got a magnifying glass, it'll say, you know, 47K ohms right on there and, yeah. and you're done. You just read it. It's, it's literally right there. But anyway, the general answer to your question is, yeah, the parts are small. The model numbers and part numbers and value markings are small and sometimes kind of smeary. What we do is we put in the manuals, and this is, again, for the DIY stuff, we put a photo of every component in the front of the book within the bill of materials listing, and then we, we reprint the value right there, and we encourage people to buy a magnifying glass because that's just the reality. You need to be able to read it so you don't put the wrong parts in the wrong place. Now, are you using one of these kind of um, flexi arm magnifying glass that has the light built in behind it and all that kind of stuff, or you put it in front of your face and look down and, and do your work underneath it. Is it, is it that sort of thing? No, I uh, never got one of those. I did buy one of the, the goofy jewelers head worn things. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, with the, the lenses that flip down in front of your face. I have that. I mean, and those are like $12. They're not expensive, but it's, it's uncomfortable. So I don't even use that. I, what I use is a little handheld I bought it on Amazon. It's a little rectangular thing and you slide the cover away from the lens and it turns on an LED light. And it's, I've got a link to it on the Microphone Parts website. Uh, there's oh, okay, a, we have cool. a section of DIY tools. And I think they're like 
I don't know, 10 or $15 for this thing, but it literally lives right next to my soldering iron. And I can't build a kit without it because I just can't, I can't read the parts. Okay, cool. Part Maybe we'll include that link in the show notes as well too. But um, let me see, what about reading glasses? Could we use that? I'll get off this topic, but is this something where we could just get good reading glasses and do it that way as well? I have no idea. All I mean, right. It depends on, depends All on your right. eyes. I don't know. Okay, cool. All right. Well, let's keep moving forward. So, um, Matt, uh, I'd like to ask our guests to share an inspirational quote on the podcast, get us excited about recording, DIY, microphones, what, what have you. Do you have anything you'd like to share with us? Yeah, I mean, it's not phrased as a sort of something you tattoo on your arm, but it's basically use your ears. And I know that's totally cliche, but I get this question in my via email a couple times a day, you know, what's the best microphone for whatever? And I think, well, you tell me. I mean, I don't know what you think the best microphone is. If there was one best mic, then there wouldn't be 2,000 microphones on the market. Mm. So what people don't want to do, because it means they have to make a decision. <laughs> and I'm sure all the rock stars listening are smarter than this. So I'm preaching to the choir here. But, you know, if, if you're shopping for a mic, you borrow or rent or you go to the local studio and you pay for an hour of studio time and you hear all the ones that they've got. And you bring your guitar and you bring your voice and you stand there and you listen to them and you learn that way. That is the only way to learn. There isn't an ad or a celebrity endorsement or an email from someone like me who's going to tell you what microphone you will love. True. It's, you're going to just have to love it. <laughs> just got to hear it and love it. Well, Matt, let's tie a couple of things together here because you know, it's a great quote. Use your ears is something that we are constantly revisiting in the studio and needing to remember over and over again. And it's obviously what you did when you were going from drums to learning more about microphones and ultimately building your own microphone company and, you know, designing a line of microphones. Can you talk about what some of the things were that you felt like you were hearing and that caused you to create a microphone that sounds the way you wanted it to? Yeah. So, um, so this is a, a bigger topic than the question suggests. And this gets into, you know, so we kind of set up this topic for today of how to build your mic locker. And so, yeah. you know, the, the, the key, so I'm just going to, I'm going to get into this a little bit and, and feel free to interrupt or just. No, no, we can segue into off. our topic of the day too. I always ask too many questions before we get to the heart of it. <laughs> All right. So yeah, the gist of this is it's about diversity. Bottom line is you don't want a bunch of microphones that sound the same. Why? Well, because when someone comes into your studio and they pick out their acoustic guitar and they start playing and the microphone that's on there sounds, you know, thin and maybe a little piercing or it's getting a lot of string noise, but not none of the body of the instrument. You take that microphone down. I mean, you can hear that it doesn't sound very good. You take that microphone down, you put up another one and it sounds exactly the same. So what have you, what have you done for your session? Right. right. You need, you need microphones that sound different. So you need diversity. And there's actually a, a fairly systematic way to approach this. It reminds me of an email that I got from a guy who said, hey, I want to, he was, he was smart enough to say, I, you know, I, I want to buy a new microphone that complements my collection. And I said, that's a great point. I thank you for, for having that foresight. Tell me about your collection. He says, I've got a whole bunch of microphones. I said, well, okay, well, you know, let's hear it. And he says, well, I've got the MXL 2006 and the MXL V63M and a pair of the MXL 990 and a pair of the MXL 603S and a pair of the CAD GXL 2400. And I said, okay, those are all the same microphone. <laughs> <laughs> they all have exactly the same circuit and one of two different capsules. Wow. Um, and, and there are subtle differences due to body size and shape and the grill construction and so on and so forth. But all those microphones follow the same recipe, which is a certain kind of capsule with a certain kind of circuit. And so it's going to deliver a certain kind of sound. And so his sessions were probably pretty rocky because there was never any reason for him to take down one mic and put up another. Yeah. So what you want is, what you want is diversity. Um, and the systematic way, so at a grander scale, that probably means some dynamics, some ribbons, some condensers. And then within condensers, you probably want some large diaphragm and some small diaphragm. Okay, because there's different mics for every application. And of course, any mic can be used on any source, you know, within, within the boundaries of physics, right? You're not going to mic a, a snare drum solo from two inches away with a super high output condenser mic because it will just record a lot of clipping sounds. Okay, so there's things that, where the application just doesn't make sense. But in general, most anything can be used on most anything if you compromise, you know, the rest of your vocal chain and so, or your signal chain in some way. 
but there are things that are better suited to applications. Yeah. Um, so, so right now I am using a, uh, for, for this, for this recording, this podcast, I'm using my favorite dynamic mic in the world, which is a biodynamic M99. Now, if I was really great at marketing, I'd be using a Roswell condenser <laughs> and I, and I talk about it, but I sort of suck at marketing <laughs> and B I, I don't like condensers for broadcast voice. It just doesn't make sense to me. I don't need you, the audience, to be listening to street noise uh, outside my studio or people walking around or me walking around or me, you know, making whatever noises that aren't me speaking at you, right? Right. You really just want the close mic sound for a voice for broadcast. Yeah. And radio guys have been doing this forever. Yeah. So anyway, the right mic for the right application. So anyway, you want diversity, dynamics, ribbons, condensers, but... At the end of the day, you'll have a bunch of condenser mics because that's what most people want to use on a lot of sources. Yeah. Um, let I, me, let me, I, I feel like I sense that you're about to give us insights into how to select among those things, but I wanted to make sure we covered this question too. If you feel like you can answer it, how do you think that the person you're describing in your story, how do you think they ended up having the same mic, lots of the same mic in the studio? Because it might be good to know that too. Ah, so. I don't know the answer to that question. I have an idea about the answer to that question. And I'll throw this out there and you and your folks listening can comment or email me or tell me I'm wrong or tell me I'm right because it's good market research. And, and you're welcome to call them the rock stars if you want to. <laughs> right on. <laughs> I do. I mean, I'm used to it now. <laughs> so I think for too long, microphones have been too confusing. It was certainly true for me before I started so with recording hacks, when I started recording hacks, I knew not a lot about microphones. I just knew that they sounded different. And then I really wanted to know why. And that the, you know, the process is recordinghacks.com. The process of me trying to answer that question. Cool. So you look at a microphone and some things are obvious, size, shape, color. The manufacturer will tell you large diaphragm, small diaphragm, or dynamic or ribbon or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, there might be switches on it or not. But basically everything else is a black box, right? Sound goes in volts come out. Right. What happens inside, I have no idea. Yeah. Now, I never um, know what's going on with circuitry. That's the last thing I've ever thought about inside a mic. Yeah. Um, Other than so maybe I think that's, a tube mic. Right. Yeah. So again, that, obvious because it's got a, a big heavy power supply that you have to plug in. Yeah. So it's a black box. And, and so how do you make a purchase decision? Like if you, if you take it as a given that you can't know what's happening inside, you're left with advertising claims most of which say, this is the best microphone ever for every source, right? That's right. You see that all the time, at least at the lower end of the price spectrum. Or features or, or manufacturer reputation. But also I think people have brand loyalty. So they buy one microphone, they like it, they go back to that same brand and they think, well, I liked this one, so I'll like whatever else they do. Some manufacturers are better at providing diversity than others. For some companies, it's just not really a priority because of a lot of reasons. Economics is a big one. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what happens is, is people buy based on, on brand loyalty or maybe advertising claims. But what I would suggest to all the rock stars is to take that next step and I'll try to make it so it's not, I don't, I don't think it's that complicated. I think, I think I can tell you all a few things that will help you grasp the market and, cl and begin to classify microphones. And, you know, none of this is going to tell you which of the hundreds of available microphones you should buy next. Again, nobody can tell you that. That's something you have to answer for yourself. What I would love to do, and what I think we can do, is give you a framework that lets you classify some of the choices. So you say, oh, everything I own is in this sort of grouping. Mm -hmm. So if I want something that sounds different in order to serve this goal of diversity, sonic diversity in my mic locker, then I need to buy from some other classification. You know, And yeah. again, it's obvious at some level because if everything you own is a condenser, well, go buy a ribbon. I mean, it'll be a night and day difference in sound. And you know, maybe you'll hate it but it'll for sure sound different and it'll give you, it'll expand your palate, which ultimately is a good thing. True, but I'm really fascinated by, you know, your ability to share with us insights into what makes different condensers different because sometimes I do feel like a collection of carefully chosen condensers can make a really compelling recording. And sometimes mixing up condensers and ribbons or, or dynamics are, is almost too contrasting. But I mean, they, they all work. They all work in different situations. But I was trying to think about how it was that I got mics. And I think a lot of times that, you know, I just had the, the luck to hear somebody using a mic in a situation and then go, oh, I always really liked the sound of that mic, so I'm going to go get it. 
but not everybody's got that. And, and, I, and I never really did consider what was going on inside the mic other than I had heard it on a particular instrument. So uh, I don't mean to derail it or take over. Just keep going. I'm, I'm really fascinated by this. All right. So what's inside a condenser mic? And again, this is we're, what we're trying to get to is how do we classify a bunch of choices so you can make more intelligent decisions about which way to go when you've got a couple of hundred bucks to spend. What's inside the microphone is basically two things. You've got a capsule and you've got a circuit. Okay, very basic. The capsule is a thing at the top. It's the actual transducer. It's, the, uh, it's analogous to the speaker, the actual driver in a monitor, for example. It's the thing that converts energy from one form to another. In this case, uh, sound waves into a voltage. So that's the capsule. And then there's the circuit. The circuit could take a couple of different forms. It could be a transistor-based circuit. It could be a tube-based circuit. It could be a hybrid of both. And then at the back half of that circuit, if you want to take it sort of one level deeper in, the output could be uh, transistor-based or it could be transformer-based or it could be tube-based, although that's more uncommon or less common. But here's the interesting thing about circuits. The vast majority of them are linear with respect to frequency. So that sounds like a lot of gibberish, but let, mm. me, let me break that down. Most microphone circuits don't apply any EQ to the signal coming off the capsule. Mm -hmm. That's true of the Neumann U47, for example. The most famous microphone ever made had no EQ in the circuit. I think that's a valuable thing to remember. Mm -hmm. So uh, the exception to that would be mics like the U87 and the U67, which apply a, a bandpass filter. Um, so right. The, 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 I, I have a U67, and I remember discovering that. And my understanding was that that had to do with broadcast restrictions or something like that. Is that right? I've heard that story told. I believe it to be true because the person who told me is very reliable. I've never attempted to verify it. But what I heard about the U87 is that German broadcast rules said that you cannot pass frequencies above 13K. Right. So the U87 has a fairly aggressive low-pass filter that cuts out everything beginning, a pro, I don't know, I'm guessing around 8, 8K or so, I don't remember the graph of the circuit sweep, but certainly above 12, 13, 14, above that range, there's not much getting past. The side effect of that, of that aggressive cut is that the natural peak of the capsule is also attenuated, which is why the U87 doesn't sound very, very bright, whereas most Chinese microphones that use that same capsule do sound irritatingly bright. Interesting, interesting. And just for um, uh, reminder's sake, let the rock stars know what is the, the, the upper limit of human hearing that we would normally might want to reach for. Or I don't know whether we might want to, but 13K well, <laughs> as opposed to what? Well, there's, it's, <laughs> depends on your age. There's a, a <laughs> quick side story. We were at the, uh, there's a museum in San Francisco, uh, sort of kids, hands-on discovery museum called the Exploratorium. And they had an exhibit about audio. And they had a, a pair of headphones that you'd put on, and then you'd press buttons, 8K, 9K, 10K. And I swear to God, everything above about 16K was broken. I thought, sure, the buttons were broken. And my kid's like, no, I can hear those just fine. <laughs> oh, no. So it depends on yeah. your age. As you get older, your high frequency sensitivity rolls off. So I'm, I, can, I can still hear 16. I cannot hear 17 anymore. Oh, I can't hear 16 anymore. No. I could, I probably 12... Somewhere up, up there is where it starts to, you know, 13 is probably be, I wouldn't miss it too much above 13, honestly. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it was interesting because I, I had a chance to interview David Blackmer years ago in his office. Um, at and he's Earth, the one Earthworks. who wrote the article, The World Above 100K or something like that, right? Right. And he told me in the interview, he said, I can't hear above 8K, but it doesn't matter because I hear the effects of what's going on above 8K. So exactly. Really well, that's, we're, we're, we're always aware. Yeah. And so I, I haven't gotten deep into that. There, there is, he, he, he or someone at one of his companies wrote a paper, and I think the title is The World Above 100 Kilohertz. And it's an argument for why super high frequencies matter in your recording chain. And why they would do that is because Earthworks makes microphones that are rated to be relatively flat out to 30, 40, 50 K. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you, I would recommend that as follow-up reading for people who are interested. That's cool. I didn't um, know about anyway, that. Anyway, the, the widely accepted standard is, you know, 20 to 20, right? 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. You know, I also remember being at the uh, 
department store as an eight or nine year old and hearing this super annoying high pitched whine. And it was, it was, it seemed miraculous to me that nobody else was irritated because I, I hated going to the store because I, it hurt my ears. Mm-hmm. And I figured out 20 years later, oh, nobody else could hear it. Just the little kids who were being dragged along to, you know, go Christmas shopping or whatever. Can I guess what it was? I have no idea what oh, it was. It was the TV sets that were broadcasting. They were playing back television stuff all through the store. It was probably like a 15K uh, town, right? Yeah, maybe. I had a roommate here. I used to have a, a um, you know, a cathode ray tube TV before I got my flat screen one. And I, you know, I, I had mine a lot longer than everybody else kept theirs, you know. And I had a roommate and he came in and he was just like, he's like, oh man, you don't hear that? It's killing me. And I was like, what? I, I had no idea. And I remember <laughs> I, I got an app for my iPhone and I looked on it and there, sure enough, there was a 15K spike right there in the real time wow. analyzer. And I was like, oh man, I'm really sorry, dude. I, I just didn't know. Yeah. So who knows? Maybe that's where my 15K went was, you know, years of that television. <laughs> Too many movies. <laughs> yeah. But, well, that's fascinating. So, okay, sorry to bring it back on track. The U87 had this filter, but generally speaking, the circuitry and microphones do not have any EQ to them. In other words... Typically not. I yeah, would, I would interpret often, that as, as you saying the circuitry is not imparting a sound or an EQ sound to the sound. Well, it's... It's not, it's not affecting the sound from the capsule. I mean, the, the circuit's job is basically to lower the impedance of the capsule. And I don't want to go into that because th- then we're getting to electrician kind of territory. But it's, it's in a lot of cases, it's not really even a gain circuit. But it's, it's just, it's an impedance converter. But anyway, mm-hmm. it's not applying EQ, you know, acoustic EQ to the sound of the capsule. But what the circuit does or, or doesn't do, and this is, this is part of that framework I was trying to get to, is the circuit is the source of harmonic coloration, okay? Another word for harmonic coloration is distortion. Right. So in the old days, this is what microphones sounded like because they all had tubes, they all had transformers. And a side effect of all of that circuitry, the tube and the transformer, is that they would generate harmonics, preferably even order, but sometimes odd order, you know, third harmonics. And that affects the sound. Now, excuse me, it's not a, it's, it's hard to describe what this is but it, a microphone that has a lot of that sort of harmonic content, it has more grit, more authority. Uh, it tends to cut through a mix without being louder. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's the quality that people associate with vintage mics. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a complaint that some people have about, you know, newer modern mics. Because, you know, for a lot of people, their entire experience with recording microphones, with studio microphones, is stuff that you buy in Guitar Center for $49. Mm-hmm. And by and large, all of those microphones are transformerless, which means they have none of this kind of harmonic content. And so you're just not, if you're not used to that sound, then it's, it's hard to imagine what that would be. But I would encourage those of you who have that, have that experience to borrow microphones that are built to mimic a vintage model or that have, you know, these other ingredients in them. You know, and, and listen for the difference. And you couple that with, you know, modern mic preamps that are trying to be transparent or, you know, digital DAWs that are trying to, that are, you know, by nature inherently transparent. I guess that's a, that's a separate topic. But, um, you know, it's sort of like you're having multiple layers of lack of harmonic content. That's right. Yeah. And, and actually, I'm glad you brought up the preamp idea because that's, that's another great way to do it. You take your, your inexpensive mic and you plug it straight into your DAW, which is almost guaranteed to be transformerless. Uh, and you record something, it can just be a, you know, your, your own voice. And then get a, if you have a preamp or you can borrow a preamp that has some good transformers in it. And you have to be careful there because some of the really inexpensive stuff, especially, you know, the $100 tube preamps that you can buy, that's not really the thing that we're talking about. Those tubes are really just a visual effect in a lot of cases. Right, they right. light up, but that's, that's <laughs> all they do. Um, but if you, can, if you can try that, you know, get a good tube preamp out of the same microphone, then you'll really hear what the, what the difference is. So that's a good idea. I use a little inexpensive Mackie USB box. In fact, I've got it here. It's, uh, it's called the Onyx Blackjack. And I think they're like down to $69. Wow. Um, built like a tank. It's super useful for me. It's a two channel, you know, two mic pre USB device does not have an external power supply. So it's bus powered, which is super convenient. Mm -hmm. We never do more than one thing at a time with it, right? But that's basically our our bench 
power supply for doing QC on microphones because it's 30 bucks a channel. Okay, so if, if the mics that we build sound great through a $30 a channel preamp, we're very confident they're going to sound great through anything else. Cool. And what I can say about that is that voltage measurements, and again, we've only done one mic at a time on these, but the, it's putting out a full 48 volts into the mic. Now, if you had two, maybe it would drop. I don't know. Mackie's got a pretty good reputation for building good circuits. At least that's my experience. Their headphone amps are nice and they seem to drive mics without a problem. Yeah. I've heard of other preamps that sort of starve the phantom power supply. All condenser mics do not draw the exact same amount of power out of the preamp. The one that comes to mind that draws more is the CAD M179. So if you don't know that mic, it's a fairly nice, low-cost mic. It's one of the least expensive, continuously variable, multi-pattern condensers that I know of. Hmm. Um, but it's known for drawing more current, which is to say it puts a higher demand on the preamp. So just to put some numbers on it, uh, not that anyone needs to remember any of this, but that mic draws something like 8 to 10 milliamps of current. If you compare that to the Neumann KM84, which was a, a pencil mic, but that circuit is used in other places too, that draws 0 0.4 milliamps. So that's a 20 times difference between the two microphones. Now, where that comes into play is that some microphones, especially if you have a bunch of them all stacked up on a single session, uh, if they all draw a ton of current, then your preamp might struggle to supply all of them with enough. Uh, and so you just have to watch for that in your session. So I feel like a takeaway for those of us who aren't going to be, you know, as mad scientists on the inside of a mic is that it's just to be aware that, you know, what you're introducing us to, the circuitry inside these mics, they, they all, inside the black box is different stuff going on. And the result might be, that you plug in these two mics, both of which sound great, into a particular situation, and they may sound very different from each other as a result of that kind of stuff. It's true. And often what you'll hear is loss of headroom. That's how low phantom often manifests itself. Okay. Um, so if the mic, if you have a microphone that works well on, on one preamp, but not on another, often it's, a, it's, a, it's being starved of phantom power. Or if it, yeah, and if the way that it doesn't sound good on the certain preamp that where it doesn't sound good is that it sounds crunchy or, or has lower output or something like that, uh, yeah, it's probably a phantom power issue. Um, okay, uh, I apologize to continue to do this, but we're on, we're on phantom power. Phantom power and ribbon mics. What do you want to say about that? <laughs> so, uh, you know, I have mixed feelings about this. So the general thought is that phantom power can like explode ribbon mics, right? That's what people are yeah, afraid we're terrified. of. So there's a really great demo video and I believe it was put together by John Ulrig, who's the guy behind shiny box. And what he did was he took the, the grill off of a, a ribbon and he plugged it in and out of phantom power. And the ribbon was bouncing up and down like that bridge in, in Washington that basically <laughs> self-destructed due to harmonic resonance when the wind blew through the canyon. So this ribbon is shooting up and down. It didn't blow or, or snap would be a more accurate description. But you could see that that full excursion was not doing good things to it because it, it basically pulls all the corrugations out and then the ribbon sags and then it doesn't transduce nearly as well. Right. But that doesn't happen if the mic is plugged in and you engage phantom power. It only happens in a patch-based situation where you're plugging, a, I believe, when you're plugging in like a quarter-inch connector and so it's partially connected for that moment as you're doing the insertion. That's right. the thing that really kills it. Which technically, if you plugged an XLR into a mic, you might not get the partial insertion, but you still might for a moment. You still might, yeah. So, so my so, takeaway is it's still dangerous rock stars. Don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's overblown, but it's, it's probably overblown in a way that prevents people from ruining their mics, so it's okay. In other words, I think you're less likely to do damage than you're afraid you are. Yeah. But you might as well be afraid of it because if that prevents you from, you know, doing that 2% of the time sort of mistake. Well, let's clarify let's clarify for rock stars who maybe uh, maybe we just jumped into the topic and they didn't know the the precedent for it. So, rock stars a reminder with ribbon mics, unless it's actually a phantom powered ribbon mic, you absolutely just play it safe, just don't let any phantom power go to your ribbon mic in it whether it's a flipped on switch, a patched in or plugged in cord. Just avoid yeah. sending phantom to your ribbon mics. All right, good. But so, I can I can one up that though. Okay, um, go ahead. Go ahead. The uh, 
there's a product out there called the Cloud Lifter, and it's made by one of the nicest guys in, in the industry, Roger Cloud, based in Tucson. It's all made in the U.S., uh, made by Native Americans, actually. Um, oh, really? It's a little blue box. It costs $149. Um, and I, I, I don't get a kickback for saying this. I've just, I was an early adopter. I wrote a couple of reviews of the Cloud Lifter CL1 on Recording Hacks years ago and, um, and loved it. And basically, so now that I've told you it's great, what is it? It's basically a, f they don't call it this. It's basically a pre preamp. They call it a mic activator, but no one knows what that means. So I call it like a pre preamp or an inline preamp. And so what happens is you plug your ribbon mic into this, and then you plug this box, this little blue box into your, into your proper preamp or your DAW. And then you turn on phantom power and you just said, Oh my God, never give phantom power to a ribbon. Well, in this case you do because this little blue box called a cloud lifter, it takes that phantom power and turns it into about 24 decibels of very, very clean gain. And then of course it does not allow phantom power to pass through to the mic. So what it does is it gives, so ribbon mics, if you've never used one, one of the characteristics that's hard to wrap your head around is it has very low output, like maddeningly low output. If you're used to condensers and you plug in a ribbon, you'll think it's broken because the signal that you usually get out of it isn't there. And you have to, you have to dime your preamp to hear anything. Yeah. So this gives you, oh, and the problem with cranking your preamp up to 11 is that it sounds terrible, right? Especially for a lower cost preamp, you'll get a lot of hash and noise and hiss out of that top quarter of the rotation of the, of the gain knob. But it goes to 11. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it sounds bad at 11. So <laughs> you plug in the, uh, this inline preamp or mic activator as they call it. And it, it means you can run your preamp gain at about, I mean, it depends on the source, depends on the mic, but say at around noon instead of all the way up. And then side benefit, you don't need to worry about phantom power. So anyway, 149 bucks, it basically turns your ribbon mic into the mic that it should have been in the first place, which is to say phantom powered with a really high clean output level. Dude, that's so cool because I have one of those and we actually got it because we thought it was going to help us with our SM7. And, and I it, haven't it should. even- should. But well, and it, it didn't really, it didn't seem to change the noise floor because I still had to, I, maybe because the noise floor was just coming from the SM7, I don't know. But I hadn't tried it on a ribbon yet. So now I'm really excited to go try it on all my ribbons and see how they, how much better they sound. Matt, I feel like with some of these discussions, I've kind of derailed you from the topic of the day, which was your desire to share with us more insights into condenser mics and, you know, how we can understand the differences with these capsules and make sure that we're actually selecting and building a mic locker that, that is complementary to each other rather than all the same color. Yeah, no worries at all. And I appreciate you bringing it back because I feel like I've been dancing around the issue a little bit, but I, I will try to lay it out very clearly. So we're talking about large diaphragm condensers. And uh, inside that device is the, a capsule and a circuit. Now, the reality is there's really only a couple of core capsule designs, enough that you can keep them in your head. And there's really only a couple of uh, core circuit topologies. And again, enough that you can keep them, or few enough that you can keep them in your head. And that is the basis for this framework. Now, the disclaimer that I always have to make is that there's a million variations of both, but those variations tend to impart more subtle sonic changes. So if you were to say, so let's list the three capsule types that are typically used and typically found in large diaphragm condenser designs. Cool. The, there's the K47, there's the K67, and there's the CK12. Uh, the, the, the first two, the K47 and the K67 were developed by Neumann, and the CK12 was developed by AKG, and that's visually distinctive because it ha doesn't have a screw in the center of the, of the diaphragm. It's what's called an edge-terminated design, which has its own sonic uh, impact. There are, again, variations, but those are the three core types. Some people will talk about the M7 type. That was uh, another neumann Gefell capsule design. It was used in the U47 initially, but it's, uh, it's basically a K47 kind of sound. So I've, just for the purposes of simplification, I'm going to lump those together. Also, it's a harder to find capsule. Um, so if, typically, if you're, if you're shopping for mics, these are the three capsules that you're going to find in a large diaphragm condenser. And they sound pretty different. Um, now, let's put that aside for the moment and talk about circuits. Again, there's a million ways to do it, but they can be grouped into a couple of key topologies or types. 
One would be, th there can be a JFET, uh, which is a transistor, or a tube that's doing this first stage of work of impedance conversion. Uh, and then on the outputs, that's the input side, on the output side, you can have a transformer or you can not have a transformer. And again, lots of variations there, but that's the core distinction because transformers tend to do things that electronically balanced or transistor output circuits don't, mm -hmm. um, which is in part sonic artifacts. Now the world's most perfect transformer would have none of those artifacts, but in fact, most transformers do for a variety of reasons. So again, let's, let's back up. So we've got three basic capsule types and you've got a couple of basic circuit topologies. Typically what you'd find is transformerless circuit, mm -hmm. uh, transformer JFET circuit, which is still solid state, or transformer tube circuit. So that we're, we're kind of splitting the input and the output there. The input is either a, a JFET or a tube, and the output is, is a transformer or transformerless. Okay, so, so that's really four choices, right? Two different inputs, two different outputs, but in practice, you rarely see a tube circuit with a transformerless output. I have seen a couple, but it's not a common choice, so we'll leave it aside. Yeah. So let me let me pause for a sec because I'm trying to keep up with this. This is, first off, this is amazing. Like I've never had anybody break down, you know, a simplicity on the inside of a mic. Um, so like the capsules, you know, 47, 67, 12. Obviously, those to me sound like, you know, the AKG C12, the the Neumann U67, the Neumann U47. And I didn't realize those were distinct capsules that sort of make up future mics as well. But um, on the circuit side, so you talked about no transformer and then transformer JFET, transformer tube. Is that a transformer on the input of that circuit? And does that mean that there's a transformer between the capsule and the circuit in the mic or just on the outside, the output of the mic? Um, good question. And I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. So the uh, so preamps can have a transformer on the input, but not microphones. So microphone typically, in simplistic terms, you've got a capsule that's connected to either a JFET or a tube. Okay. Right. Sometimes there's a capacitor in between, sometimes not. So the transformer would be on the output. So the three circuit topologies are transformerless JFET, uh, transformer JFET, and transformer tube. And I guess that's confusing because I'm giving you output first. So right, if you want right. to say input to output, it would be JFET transformerless or JFET transformer or tube transformer. And JFET, if, we, if we've heard of a FET mic, like a FET 47, that's a JFET. It is, but to say something's a FET mic, all that means is it's not a tube mic. It doesn't tell you what the output is like. Okay, interesting. So anyway, let me, let me jump into uh, why this is worth even talking about. So first of all, you, you are correct. Uh, U47 had a certain kind of capsule in it, different from the U67, which had a different kind of capsule, and different from the C12 and the Elam 251, which was kind of like the sibling mic to the AKG C12. All three of those, or rather four of those, they had different capsules, and they sound different. Okay, they sound pretty different. So the K47 capsule tends to have forward mids. So in that four to six kilohertz range, there's a big presence bump there. Um, mm -hmm. Doesn't make it good, doesn't make it bad. It's just what that sounds like. The K67 capsule, which was used in the Neumann U67 and the Neumann U87, and still is used in the U87, the K67 capsule has a presence peak that's higher. So somewhere north of 8 kilohertz, 8 to 12, somewhere in that range. Hmm. Whereas the CK12, which was the AKG capsule that was in the AKG C12 and the Telefunken Elam 251, that's the edge terminated one. That one has, again, a very different presence peak, not as sharp as the other models I just described and, and a sort of broader presence peak as well. And I'm, I'm mostly talking about the high end here because that's the, that's the difference that most people hear. There are differences in the low end as well, but they're more subtle. Mm -hmm. um, so the easiest way to have a microphone that sounds different is to pick one that is a different capsule. It's as simple as that. What was the frequency of the CK12? What was the upper frequency it's, um, range? It's broader and flatter. And it varies from model to model. And the other thing that you find with, with vintage capsules is 50 years later, they sound different than they used to. Yeah. Um, you so know, a, a, a thought that pops into mind is having seen people more often put a pair of uh, AKG, AKG C12s as overheads on a drum kit 
rather than 47s and 67s. Um, although I've seen 67s, but I wonder, does that have to do with this, you know, rewinding back to your reaction to the way Mike sounded on your drums and how you don't necessarily want that added sibilant boost above your cymbals? That might be a tangent question, but it just popped into my head. It is a tangent question, but, you know, it's up to the engineer. I mean, some people like really bright microphones on overheads because they want to hear the cymbals. Um, other people hate hearing cymbals and they use ribbon mics on overheads, which is a really sort of dark and thick tone. But it depends on the drummer in the room and the size of the cymbals. If they're, if they're great big, thick cymbals, then they're going to sound different than if they're small and, and thin. Okay. And if the guy hits them really hard, then they're going to be louder and brighter than if, if someone plays with restraint. So you have to pick mics that suit the session. And it's really, you know, the session is about the room and the drums and the, inst the, the instrument, right? Yeah. The cymbals and the way the guy hits them. And, and, you know, now that I'm asking that, I'm remembering that I've seen and heard your video of the Mini K47, which I assume is a 47 capsule above drums, and it sounds fantastic. Um, so I guess I'm throwing away my theory as just as quickly as I offered it. No worries. It, there is no right and wrong. And I get that question all the time. What's the best mic for X? And I say, well, there, there isn't. You know, you tell me. And I think I mentioned that before. It's just, it's up to, there's a, there's a lot of leeway for personal taste, which is why, you know, that's why recording studio rock stars exist, right? You're, everyone here is trying to figure out neat new ways to do things, not the right way yeah. to do things. There isn't a right way. You're trying to find out what works for you and your equipment and your, and your clients and things like that. Yeah. Anyway, so should we get back in? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Sorry. <laughs> so again, a, a couple of capsule types, K47, K67, CK12, the three of those sound pretty different. And then there's a couple of circuit types. They sound different too, but it's a more subtle difference because as I mentioned before, most microphone circuits are linear with respect to frequency. They will differ in terms of harmonic content or distortion. That's the same thing. Those two are the same thing. And you can hear that for sure. But it's a more subtle difference than if you say, you know, the K47 is plus 5 dB at 5K and the K67 is plus, you know, 6 dB at 10K. Anybody can hear that difference. Right. So it's a much more significant distinction between capsules than, than there is between circuit types. But anyway, let's take this as, as a sort of three by three grid, okay? Across the top of your three by three sort of tic-tac-toe table, you've got K47, K67, CK12. And then down the rows, you've got uh, JFET transformerless, uh, which is a sort of modern sounding circuit. You've got JFET transformer, and then you've got tube transformer. And if all of your, so you got nine boxes, right? Um, yeah. If you, if all of your mics in your collection are in one of those boxes, then you don't have a lot of diversity in your mic locker. And the way that you would, would add diversity would be to start buying microphones that can be classified into one of those other, one of the oh, other boxes super in that cool. grid. I like that image. I like that image. And hopefully in this case, um, unlike tic-tac-toe, you can actually kind of win. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yeah, and so I, I can uh, I'll put together a, a PDF download that that tries to line this out or draw this out, and I can awesome. suggest a couple of choices in some of those boxes. And I, I you know I haven't classified choices for each, and I, I definitely don't want to suggest that I can tell you what the best mic in each one of those nine boxes should be. And also, there may not be microphones in some of those boxes, just because some of those combinations make less sense. But that's the basic framework. And as I mentioned before about diversity, it's not all about condensers and it's certainly not all about large diaphragm condensers. But when it comes down to it, a large diaphragm condenser mic is probably what you're going to reach for, for the vocals, maybe for the acoustic guitar. And you can absolutely use it on guitar cab and bass mm -hmm. and acoustic bass. And if you're miking an ensemble, that's probably what you want. You know, so there's a lot of applications for large diaphragm condenser mics. And so that's why I tend to focus on this there's a lot of sonic variation there. And again, I think there's a pretty easy way to approach, you know, uh, sourcing different sounding mics, and which I think is really key for uh, having a good session. I think that's great. I love that visual image of the grid. And uh, Rockstars, we are going to 
make a link for you. I'll mention it now, and then I'll mention it again. It'll be in the show notes, of course. But you'll be able to go to rsrockstars.com slash Mike Locker, L-O-C-K-E-R, and Mike, of course, M-I-C. And so uh, and you'll just be able to download uh, this PDF and all the resources for the stuff we're talking about with Matt. So super cool. Matt, do we want to talk about small diaphragm condensers as well? Is that on this this topic list today? Um, uh, we, can, we can talk a little bit about them. Yeah, there ends up being, I think, fewer choices in my experience. You will see the same circuit topology differences. But the thing about condenser mics is the sound mostly comes from the capsule. What you'll find, certainly what I've found, is that the transducer is, is where there's a big, the biggest opportunity to change the sound of something. And so in a speaker, in a monitor, the voice coil or the, the actual element, the driver, is where the electrical energy is converted into acoustic energy. And that's going to have a giant impact on the way those vibrations come out. And a mic- microphone capsule is the same thing in reverse. You know, if, you, if you're speaking into a microphone, your voice sounds the same every time, but it's the capsule that's changing how those acoustic vibrations are converted to voltage. And, and that, what, that makes sense. You know, you think about a, a guitar and guitars have the same sets of strings on them, but it's the differences in wood and things like that that make help a guitar have different sound and quality. Absolutely, different tone, yeah. So in small diaphragm mics, all the same things I said still apply, but I, I find that there are just fewer choices out there. So there are companies that make transformerless JFET mics. The Shep CMC5 is the sort of canonical example. The circuit in that mic is the most common circuit in the world. Why is that? Because that's the one that all the Chinese factories copied when they started making microphones. So interesting. most of the inexpensive condenser mics that you can buy for, you know, under a hundred, maybe even $200, they use some kind of cheap version of that circuit. And the circuit itself is a miracle of electronic design. It delivers incredibly high performance if built well, but it can also be built on the cheap and it still works. And sounds okay. So anyway, that's a very popular circuit. So that's a transformerless example. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the canonical examples of a transformer JFET circuit would be the Neumann KM84. That mic has not been made in a long time. It lives on, in a sense, in the KM184, although that mic sounds different and is, seems to be less well-liked than the original. So those are two different circuits there. There are tube STCs as well, both modern and vintage. But these tend to be... Well, look at it this way. So there, it's not usually the case that you can swap capsules across small diaphragm mics in the way that you can when you're building a large diaphragm microphone or when you're buying, when you're shopping for a large diaphragm mic. Hmm. Um, so, there's not, so, the, so there's not so much of a mix and match kind of approach to small diaphragm mics. So therefore, you're more likely to have similarities between salt, small diaphragms? Well, the differences would come in. Mics? I think there's just fewer choices. In small diaphragm mics, like a lot of companies make many large diaphragms and maybe one or two small diaphragm models. Mm-hmm. And I think, I, I think that's because there just isn't the, the huge variation in capsule design. Well, that's good news for us because it means it's going to be easier to make a selection and not have to think about it again. Just yeah. go look at the large diaphragms. <laughs> yeah, but small diaphragm mics, you will find a lot of sonic variation. And I would encourage people who are shopping to get their hands on some and try them out because, um, I mean, I've done this a number of times on the Recording Hacks website where I would get in a bunch of of a certain kind of microphone and do a shootout. And I know we did tube STCs once. Um, We had had a couple of small diaphragm shootouts. And I was kind of blown away by how different they sound. And it's, uh, you know, every capsule has its own color. Some circuits impart some, you know, some distortion or favorable or not. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. But then also the microphones are affected by their off-axis response. Um, and I know that the Octava MK012, which is one of my favorite, was one of my go-to SDCs for a long time. Yeah. That's kind of famous or maybe infamous for its slightly funky off-axis response. So the results that you get from that mic depend on how it colors what it's hearing from the rest of the room due to its off-axis response. Well, you know, I used to really enjoy using that mic because you had a screw-in 10 dB pad that I could put on, and I had cardioid capsules, 
on my MK12, and I would put those as tom mics overhead, you know, above the toms. Yeah. And I liked the way they sounded on the toms, but my God, when somebody hit a crash cymbal behind it, it was it ripped my head off. So <laughs> that's probably has a lot to do with that off-axis response. Can you talk a little bit, um, kind of introduce the concept of off-axis response? Because it that, that that's a concept or a terminology that often sounds really technical to us, but maybe you can explain what that means to to the rock stars. Absolutely. Microphones, much to my chagrin when I started learning how to mic up a drum kit, microphones are not like lasers, right? They don't hear in just one direction. They're described as unidirectional. And that means primarily they hear in one direction, but they hear all around. And uh, if you take a condenser mic and you speak into the back of it, you will absolutely hear your voice and it will sound terrible because because you're behind the capsule and it's picking up your voice in a very non-optimized way. They're designed to sound great from the front and ideally to not sound awful, but rather just sound quieter from everywhere else. Mm -hmm. But this word cardioid is based on the same root as uh, cardio, which is heart-shaped. So it's basically a heart-shaped pickup pattern that has a null right behind the capsule. So null meaning it hears a lot less right behind the capsule. But if you're off 90 degrees in a textbook cardioid pattern, if you take your microphone that you're facing directly at, it's pointed right at your mouth, and you rotate it 90 degrees to either side. In a textbook cardioid pattern, your voice would sound completely the same, just 6 dB quieter. So that's only 6 decibels of attenuation when you're off 90 degrees. So if I you're compress, pointing... I compress 6 dB for breakfast every morning. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're pointing a mic at your snare drum, and the hi-hat is sitting right next to the mic at that 90 degree position, then the hi-hat, which you probably didn't want to mic anyway because it's so damn loud, that's only 6 dB less and that's in your snare drum mic. Yeah. So anyway, that's, uh, so off axis means that phrase is used to describe the quality of the sound that's not at zero degrees or rather, you know, directly on in front of the mic. And so a microphone with a really good cardioid pattern, again, there's no frequency shift as you move around the mic. You just get level attenuation. In other words, it gets quieter, but the frequencies don't shift. But that's not often true. That's a very hard thing to achieve in a microphone design. And so some coloration off axis is, is pretty commonplace. And what that means is when you're off axis, when you, when you come around behind the mic or the side of the mic, it's as if someone walked up to your EQ and just moved everything around, right? So you still hear your voice, but some frequencies are a lot louder than they should be, and some are a lot quieter than they should be, and the result sounds kind of unnatural. So there really are there are some mics that attenuate sort of in a uniform across all frequencies better than other mics do? There definitely are. But typically with a large diaphragm condenser, what you'll find is that high frequencies tend to be very directional, which means as you move off to the side, you lose the highs because the highs are really only coming in the front, whereas low frequencies... Uh, tend to uh, come in everywhere. So, so as, you, as you move around the side of a microphone, it'll sound boomy. I mean, in simple terms, you'll lose the highs, but you'll gain some lows. So that's the and coloration. That, help me with my understanding of that. That is essentially like, imagine that the sound coming from behind the mic is like a light shining. And um, the, uh, I don't know, the, the body of the mic is casting a shadow so that the light, you know, the direct light doesn't come around to the front of the mic, but low frequencies are kind of like light bouncing all through the atmosphere. The low frequencies just fill up the space, so they're still coming in the front of the capsule, even if they're behind it. Is that sort of why we get variations in frequency response like that? That's part of it, and capsule design is part of it. And the result is that most large diaphragm capsule designs tend to become omnidirectional at low frequencies. I'm not sure my analogy was very expert either, but... Well, that's cool. So, um, all right. So we've got this off-axis response, um, and that really affects that. That has a lot to do with the difference in quality of small diaphragm mics. Not necessarily the difference in what we hear when we're in front of the mic, but w how useful it is in situations where you need to not kind of screw up what's behind the mic. Yeah. So the hard part about this is that the only way to know if it's going to work for you is to try it in context. So the way most people do a mic check is they hang it and they say something into it or maybe they point it at their guitar and they play the guitar. 
And then they play it back and they say, wow, that sounds great. But they're, they're mostly hearing the on-axis response unless they set up the mic backwards or something. But when you put that same microphone into a room with a live band tracking, or you use it on an instrument where there's something else, a cymbal or a horn player that's two feet away and off to one side, that's the context where you'd hear the off-axis response. So it's hard to know in a, in a sterile sort of quick mic check context what that off-axis response is going to be like. So you kind of have to try it in the context where you'd actually use it. Yeah. Well, um, I think this is really cool, man. And I really appreciate all these insights into large diaphragm, small diaphragm, you know, off axis and in, in the uh, the pickup pattern of the microphone and also like the frequency response of these different capsules. Let's jump right into uh, a question of the day here, too, because you are also designing your own microphones and, you know, you've had you have a great deal of knowledge and experience with a huge variety of mics. You have the Mini K47, you have the Delphos. Talk to us a little bit about what those mics are and, and how you chose to make those mic designs relative to some of these topics of, of capsule choice, on-axis, off-axis response, pads, things like that. Yeah, um, well, so the, the two, these two designs, the Mini K47 and the Delphos, very much came out of um, this kind of systematic approach to what what's available and what people want to buy. And the reason, it came about in, in an indirect way. So both of those models came out as a result of sales of my do-it-yourself products. Um, so this is the, mm -hmm. the microphone parts company. Um, and, the, and the most popular kits were using a certain recipe. So the recipe was a transformerless circuit with a certain kind of capsule. So one of them was the transformerless circuit with the K47 style capsule. And that was a bestseller. And I thought, you know, why is that a bestseller? Well, I think it's because that combination doesn't really exist in the marketplace. Nobody else makes that mic. And in fact, the K47 capsule is kind of underrepresented in general. You can buy K47 mics from Neumann, but they're quite expensive. I think mm -hmm. the, the TLM 49, I think it's $1,900 or something like that. It's certainly over 1000 So. There are options out there, but they tend to be expensive. And outside of that, you've got your sort of vintage mic recreations like the FET 47 collector's edition is 4,000 bucks. Uh, all the U47 clones and tributes are, you know, 2,000 and up. So if you want that kind of K47 sound in your mic locker, you didn't have a lot of choice that didn't cost 1,000 plus. So, so we had a do-it-yourself kit that allowed you to build something like this for, you know, $350. That's and cool. I was getting the question all the time, you know, can you build it for me? Can you build it for me? And I said, well, no, that's not my, we're not set up to build stuff in general. We can do one-offs, of course, but, you know, we do design and manufacturing. We're not, we don't have a back room full of people soldering stuff together. That's a, a production line. We don't have that. But it mm -hmm. suggested that there was an opportunity there. And certainly not everybody wants to solder. I get that. I mean, it's, uh, it's fun, but not for everybody. So that was the genesis of the Roswell product line. The idea was, Let's take these combinations of capsules and circuits that are underrepresented in the marketplace and put a brand name on them and manufacture them to extraordinarily high standards and, and package them well and, uh, and, and put them out on the market. And so that's the Mini K47. And we were able to get that mic out for a lower cost than the do-it-yourself kit. It's a different mic. It's not simply a built version of the do-it-yourself mic because it's intended to be a different kind of product but it does have that genuine brass single backplate K47 capsule, 34 millimeter diameter, just like the original. And then we mm -hmm. coupled it to very modern electronics, low noise, high output, low distortion. And we put it in a very compact package because it's, it's small and robust. It's easy to position. The version that we're shipping now has a really fantastic shock mount and it comes in a case. So that's, that would fit into that, that sort of transformerless transformerless JFET row in the K47 columns. That's one of those distinct boxes in the grid that doesn't have a lot of other choices in there. Do, does the Mini K47 also have a pad switch on it? It does not. No, that's one of the okay. compromises that we made in order to get it out for $299. Okay, um, cool. Um, if you wanted to use it in a situation where it might be a little higher SPL, do, we ha do you have options or do you just kind of move the mic back and give it a little more space? Uh, well, that's one of the options. 
Um, yeah, yeah cuz every every doubling of distance is worth 60 dB of attenuation, right? So if you're right up if you're at, you know, 4 inches away from your source and the mic is clipping, move it back to 8 inches and you've just bought a 6 dB pad for free. Nice. <laughs> um, now that's it, a good that's a good tip. I like that. Yeah, and as as you get further away, of course, you'll hear more of the room and less of the direct source. So it's not, you know, there's a limit to this. You can't be 26 feet away and just be like, no, it's I'm just, you know, I'm just padding the mic. <laughs> um, and then there's there I mentioned before uh, companies. Uh, I think Shure has one. I think Audio Technica has one. It's a device called an inline pad, and it's basically this XLR barrel connector. It's got an XLR on each end, and you plug it into the mic. And there's one of them. I think Shores has a switch on it, you know, 10 dB, 20 dB, 5 dB, I don't know. So that's another option. Um, yeah, we used to use those a lot in the studio. I, I don't think I have any of those now, but most of my mic pre's have a pad on them. But those things are pretty cool. And I, I feel like there's something to be gained. You can correct me on this, but sometimes there's something to be gained by padding closer to the mic than all the way at the mic pre, or is that is there no difference there? In other words, if, if you put the plugged in a pad out on the floor near the mic, would that have any difference than if you plugged it in right at the input of a mic pre? I don't think so. There's a diff certainly a difference if you're padding at the input of the mic, because if you, if there's a pad switch on the mic, that's better because then you're not, you're actually lowering voltage before it hits the JFET. So you have no risk right, of right. clipping your internal electronics. Right, right. But once you're, once you're outside the mic, I don't think it matters which end of the cable the, the pad happens. Okay, cool. Good. Um, if someone now that, knows different, let me know. But that, I, I don't know that that makes a difference. No, no, I don't. I don't know. I'm th honestly, some of these questions are just kind of things that float around in in my head in the studio, and it's great to get some feedback on them. You know, now the Delphos, on the other hand, it's different than the Mini K forty seven. It's got a different capsule design, right? And it actually does have the the pad switch on it as well. Do you want to talk about that, Mike? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's interesting. It's this, the circuit is the, kind of the same recipe. It's transformerless. JFET uh, circuit design, which is a very, very common circuit, but we build this one by hand in the U.S. with hand-picked parts, and it's it's as premium as we can make it. I mean, we, you know, t tested a bunch of resistors, found the ones that we liked best, tested a bunch of capacitors, found the ones that we liked best. So it's really, it's very much a boutique mic. The capsules are, are selected by ear, and we uh, literally EQ every microphone because the reality of capsules is that everyone is a little bit different because uh, it's, it's kind of like tuning a drum head, right? There's uh, the tension of the Mylar film makes a difference. And I'm not saying we're tuning, literally tuning the capsule. That's not a thing. Uh, not at the stage that, that, that we're using them, right? We're taking a finished capsule and we're measuring it and listening to it. And then we're EQing the circuit to best, to, to basically hit a target frequency response. Interesting. Um, so cool. the, the Neumann standard for the U87, and that's a 3,000 plus microphone, $3,000 microphone, is plus and minus 2 dB. So you need to be within this basically four decibel window for it to be called a U87. Otherwise, it goes back to the shop and they, and they fix it. And we maintain a slightly tighter standard than that, and we're doing it for a lower price point. So we're pretty proud about that. But this is a mic that we're building here in my shop in Northern California, and um, what's what's really nice about this mic is it kind of breaks the mold. So everything I've told you about, you know, these circuits, you know, where where transformer and tube circuits impart all this nice, rich, gritty, thick, warm coloration, whereas transformerless FET circuits tend to be clean and pristine and modern sounding. We sort of break that mold with this mic because it is a transformerless JFET circuit. But mm -hmm. a lot of our endorsees and reviewers are saying that it's really warm and rich and evokes the U67, which was very much a classic tube and transformer mic. And so that's just a that's an effect, a desired effect that we've managed to build into this circuit by careful selection of parts and and the topology that we've chosen. So it is so you don't get the nasty artifacts like transformer overshoot and ringing and and sort of corruptions of the sound like that. But there is a peculiar but very pleasant kind of warmth to the sound of this mic that you normally wouldn't get out of a transformerless mic. Oh, that's cool. Well, so what are some of the um, things that, I mean, you, you've got the, the Mini K47 and the Delphos both out now and had a lot of opportunity for people to use them in real world studio situations. 
What have people reported back to you are some of their favorite things to record with both of these mics? So that's a funny question because the Mini K47 was designed to be the singer-songwriter mic, right? The idea was it's a vocal mic that also sounds great on your guitar. And we started sending it out to people and they said, oh my God, this is the best guitar cab mic I've ever heard. And the next guy says, this is the best mandolin mic I've ever heard. And the next guy says, this is the best dobro mic I've ever heard. Nice. Uh, then the next guy says, you know, how is it on drum overheads? And I said, I don't know. I've never tried. It's not what it was built for, but, you know, go for it. And he writes back and says, oh my God, this is the best drum overhead mic I've ever heard. And not one of them said it's my favorite vocal mic. <laughs> so the thing, that, awesome. the thing that we designed it for was not its go-to choice. Now, we absolutely do have people who, who sing into it and love it. But what we tend to hear is that the sweet spot for this mic is instruments. And again, it, it varies. Guitar cab, acoustic guitar, uh, drum overheads, strings. And, and what's great about it is, uh, if, especially for people who are used to lower cost mics that tend to be too bright. And those two characteristics do go hand in hand. It's mostly lower cost mics that tend to be kind of unpleasantly bright. If that's what you're used to, this is a really pleasant change because it doesn't sound like that. It's yeah. not dull or dark in any way. And it's also not neutral. It's not a flat response kind of microphone. It's, it's definitely hyped a little bit, but in a good way. And it's not, maybe that's the da a dangerous word to use, but there is a presence peak to it, but it's at a space where your ears want to hear something. Yeah, that's like cool. Kind of vo vocal range. It's kind of four to six kilohertz. So, uh, so anyway, yeah, it's, the, the, the sweet spot for the mini is instruments, but it doesn't mean you can't sing into it. And again, we have endorsees who do and they, they love it. And it's, a, it's, again, it's a different sound than a lot of other mics. And contrast is key. If you, so if you hang a mic that's not working out, try this one because it's going to sound different and, and it might be just what you need. Well, that's cool. And, um, you know, physically, the Mini K47 is a different size from the Delphos. But do we think about them both as being large diaphragm microphones, though? Well, they are because uh, they both have a 34 millimeter capsule inside. Okay, cool. Um, but, it, you know, that's an interesting question because I've seen some microphones sold as a quote, large diaphragm condenser, and they don't have a large diaphragm capsule. Right. Um, now, that's, hmm. that's one of the reasons that recordinghacks.com exists, because as a consumer, I don't appreciate being lied to. And there are companies who, and I, you know, I, I, I shouldn't suggest that they're willfully deceiving anyone. I think there might just be a disconnect between the engineering group and the marketing group and some of these companies, and they just don't, it's, it's not, uh, they just don't have the structure set up to where the engineer gets to tell the story. Right. Uh, you need the checks and balances. Yeah. So for Roswell, you know, I tell the story, but I'm honest about it because I know I'm going to get crucified if I, if I don't. <laughs> so, uh, well, I, I love the backstory of how you arrived at starting the mic company and, and choosing the styles of microphones that you wanted to build it. Like they, they literally grew out of a demand and a, like a real, look behind the scenes at what goes into a microphone and then a demand from your your customers who really want that microphone you know so you you didn't just start with an idea and try and put it on people it was like here's here's the one everybody's asking for yeah well as a as a new manufacturer and this is a tough business to get into um i don't know a lot of super wealthy microphone manufacturing people this is not something people do because it's the road to riches they do it because they love it and it's true for me too but at the same time, why make something that nobody wants, you know, or that I have no idea that anybody would want? That would just be uh, really, it'd be crazy because then a year later, I'd have worked thousands of hours to bring something to fruition and have nobody care. <laughs> nice. Well, um, I think we're just about ready for a break uh, and then we'll come in for the jam session. Thank you for giving us the, the story behind Roswell and, and these two great microphones that we've been talking about, the Mini K47 and the Delphos. Is there anything else related to our selecting and building our mic locker that we didn't talk about yet that we still need to talk about? Or do we cover everything? Um, no, I think, I think we're covered. I think it's good. Okay, awesome. Rockstars, a reminder, um, I'm going to have a resource for you at rsrockstars.com slash mic locker, M-I-C-L-O-K. I didn't even spell it right. L O C K E R. Um, so you can just go there, and, and that link, of course, will be in the show notes. If you're on your mobile device, you can just click through right now with your finger and, and go click on that. And uh, we're going to have 
Matt's awesome PDF grid and and uh, stuff we talked about, and then more stuff. We actually haven't made it yet, so by the time you hear this <laughs> and you click on it, it's going to be full of cool stuff. So go check that out. Uh, Matt, we'll uh, we'll be back right in just a sec for the jam session. Then sounds good. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Super Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299 or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Are you thinking about hiring professional mastering for your song or record? Chris Graham is a billboard chart-breaking mastering engineer who has mastered thousands of songs for both pro and home studio clients just like you. Send in your song and Chris will give you a free sample master of your mix. Book a project with Chris today and also get a free video mix consultation before mastering. This will help make sure your mixes are the best that they can be. So go to chrisgrammastering.com today and get your free sample started and your record finally finished. Just click the link included in the show notes. Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. You're listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. My guest today is Matt McGlynn from Roswell Pro Audio. Really excited about digging into some more cool questions. Matt, are you ready to jam? Let's do it. Awesome. So when you started out in recording or when you started out in, in you know, learning and designing and building microphones, what was holding you back? Dude, everything. <laughs> <laughs> I had, Dude, everything. I, love I it. had no gear. I had no room. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it was, it's been a process. Uh, one, one piece at a time. Just for me... The secret was to just keep slugging away and and build it piece by piece and don't give up. Yeah. Sometimes I, I look around at my studio and I have to remind myself just how long it took to sort of acquire everything that goes into it. Yeah, but along you know, the way, you learn how to use it all too, which is really important. Yeah. Yeah. You, but I mean, my point being the same thing you said, which is you, you don't need everything at once. You just kind of, you acquire things and you just keep going. Absolutely. And, um, and I also don't need a whole ton of stuff either. I mean, if I went back to a laptop and an interface and two microphones, two mini K47s, for example, I think I'd have <laughs> plenty to make great records with. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So how about some of the best advice you received? Uh, best advice is that performance is the most important thing. Not again, not news, but worth repeating that a great performance through a compromised signal chain is going to sound better and, and have a longer life than a compromised performance through the best gear in the world. That's good advice. Now, earlier on, you kind of shared a quote about using your ears. Do you think that we use our ears to identify a great performance or do you think that's something else that we're using to listen? In other words, <laughs> is it like an emotional thing? <laughs> Um, how, how do you feel like you know when you when you when it's a great performance? You know, there's a, there's a great uh, there's a great quote. I think it's about it was about porn, right? It was about Maplethorpe or Maplethorpe, <laughs> maybe and so. Maplethorpe, yeah. It, it was the, the photographer. It, I think the Supreme Court said something like, uh, "It's hard." Maybe it's like I, I'm not quoting, but the idea was it's hard to define porn, but I know it when I see it. And right. I think the th I, same thing is true of a perform a great performance. I think um, when those hearings were going on, Frank Zappa was at the uh, center of that stuff too, in front of the the, the Senate or something. The Senate, what was it, a Senate committee or? A no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I just remember all that stuff. That was the the, the time of Tipper Gore and and uh, the uh, stickers on record labels and stuff like that. No means no. Oh, that that no was a different no. thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, all right, cool. Great stuff. Uh, how about sharing a recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, something our rock stars could use today on their next recording session? 
Uh, yeah, so this is something I'm a little bit known for, and that's th th the way it is summed up is that for drum overheads, when you're recording drum overheads, microphone height is like a fader for room sound. So I mentioned this a little bit before, but specifically with drum overheads, the higher the microphones are above the drum kit, the more of the room the microphones are going to hear. So if your room doesn't sound great, one of the ways you can beat that is by keeping the mics low. So check out the recording technique that's called Recorder Man. It's all one word. And basically you have a mic above the snare, 32 inches above the snare pointing straight down, and then a mic over the drummer's right shoulder, 32 inches away from the center of the snare. And that's about as low as overheads can, can be. And in this setup though, they're not directly above cymbals, right? One's above the snare drum and one's above the drummer. So they're not pointing right at the cymbals. And the nice thing about that is that mics are low and so they don't hear only cymbals. But because the mics are low, you get a really nice, dry, crisp drum sound. Yeah, I love that sound. We talk about the recorder man technique in my Rockstars of Drums course, um, but it's cool because I actually didn't know about the 32 inches. So I'm going to go take a look at that again and see if uh, see if that's a, a next level for, for me. Yeah, it's not, a, um, it's not a hard and fast thing. I mean, I, I literally do two drumsticks end to end because it's convenient. I used to have a piece of string when I was recording more. You know, I'd hold the string down in the center of the snare, bring mm -hmm. it up to the, to the mic, you know, pinching it there and then and then just move the string without moving my fingers, move the string to my shoulder. And that would, that would tell me where the second mic goes, but you can use two drumsticks as well. Yeah. Um, I like the idea that it's a fader for your room mic. I think that when you're listening and you're listening to your drums and if you're feeling like, geez, I wish I could hear the drums more. Uh, another translation is move the mics down a little bit and get a little closer to them, you know? Absolutely. All right, cool. So now how about, uh, talking about, a. a interesting or favorite hardware tool for the studio, something physical that you always like to have around when you're doing a session? Um, I have two. Uh, one I mentioned already is the cloud lifter. Actually, I actually think I have three. So the cloud lifter is one. That's a go-to thing for me. Number two, Latch Lake mic stands. So the guys at Latch Lake, you, you should meet them. Great guys. They go to all the trade shows and they have a, a series of mic stands. Some are, are really, really great and really, really heavy and super expensive. But they have a newer series. I think it's the 1100 series. They're mm -hmm. affordable, totally solid. It's, it's a night and day difference from the $60 stand you buy from, uh, you know, musician's friend or whatever. So that's number <laughs> two. Uh, number three is a, um, it's, I don't know what it's called. It's, it's from Triad Orbit. Uh, and it's oh, a yeah. little mic adapter. It's a little ball and socket mic adapter. I think it's called the Micro One or something. Mm -hmm. So th this was critical for me when I was doing a bunch of mic shootouts for recording hacks and I had to get a cluster of microphones together and some microphones come with clips that just aren't very positionable if that's a word and uh, like they only move in one axis for example so the secret is you you put this triad orbit micro one thing between the mic clip and the mic stand and it gives you not quite 360 but a couple hundred degrees of rotational movement so you can you can easily position microphones with this thing in a way that most mic clips and shock mounts won't let you. Yeah, I, I know Triad Orbit and I have one of their uh, stands. I think it's the T3 with the uh, the, the O2 or something like that. It's with the, the dual arms and they make some really great stuff. It's, it's like, it feels like you have a part of it, like a really well-built airplane as part of your mic stand collection, you know. Yeah. Um, and that the the uh, orbit is great because you can really loosen it and you can flip the spin the mic around in any different direction, spin it, turn it, move it up and down, and then just tighten it and it stays right where you want it. So that's that's a great tip. Okay, so um, Matt, how about sharing a favorite software tool or something that you're sort of excited about in the software world? One of my go-to software tools is called Fuzz Measure Pro, uh, which is. It's what I use for, for testing both circuits and microphones. So it's a tool where it'll play out a, a 20 to 20K sweep tone and then record whatever comes back in. And then you can measure you know, what it expected versus what it got. So that's how you can diagnose what a circuit's doing or what a microphone sounds like. And this tool also has the advantage of coming from a company with the best name in the world, which is Super Mega Ultra Groovy. <laughs> Super Mega Ultra Groovy. I love it already. Um, have you seen anybody use that tool outside of circuit design, just sort of like in a recording environment or in the studio? Is it something you might sh send through your speakers and kind of measure again with a microphone or is that would we need different software for that kind of stuff? 
I think it's primarily used for loudspeaker design and for room tuning, actually. Um, I think I think because it's not it's not perfectly set up for microphone testing. Uh, we do use it for that, but uh, I think it's primarily used for all the things you just said. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Cool. All right, great. Well, I will check that out. That sounds awesome. Um, sometimes rock stars, even if you feel like it's a little above your your technical know-how level, even to just have software that you can shoot, put put tones into the room or um, white noise, pink noise, things like that, and hear it back or measure, look at, you know, even if you're not measuring it, but you've just got a mic up and you're seeing what the levels are doing at different frequencies, it can be really eye-opening as far as what's going on in your space. So I, I encourage you to explore this stuff just to get a better sense of what's happening in your studio, even if you don't feel like you're expert enough to really understand it, because <laughs> that's where I'm at. Um, <laughs> how about sharing an organizational online resource, a tool maybe that would help us you know, keep our shit together? So the, the answer I think about for this is totally self-serving and I apologize for that, but it's, it's basically recordinghacks.com. And the reason is that a lot of the things I talk about, a lot of those ideas came out of the work that I did to build that site. And so when people ask me, ask me questions about things like phantom power and ribbons or about testing microphones, uh, what microphones sound like, you know, what capsule is in this microphone, all those answers are already online at recordinghacks.com. So if you're into, in, interested in microphones, that's the resource. Okay, awesome. Great, man. I love that. Um, and then uh, let's let's jump right to the final question here. This is hypothetical, but we're going to take the Wayback Studio Machine, and you're going to go back in time to, uh, you know, to meet young Matt McGlynn. Um, maybe, maybe you're still playing drums, or maybe you've started getting into microphones, but you're going to give yourself one bit of advice. If you could tell yourself uh, this is the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself today. What would you tell yourself? The best advice I could have given myself, uh, given where I've ended up, is buy vacuum tubes. <laughs> <laughs> buy vacuum tubes. I love it. Right, because so those that's are not, sort of a disappearing resource too, right? They are. And it's, it's not advice for any of the rock stars unless you plan to go into making microphones in, in 10 or 15 years. But then it's too late anyway. So it, it's just no, bad advice no, all around. Not, but That's not entirely true, Matt, because uh, we're also guitar players and we have amps. And to have those uh, great vintage tubes when it's time to retube an amp can be a pretty cool thing. There you go. Yeah. So get your, get your way back machine and buy a bunch of vacuum tubes. That's my advice. <laughs> All right, cool. All right. Well, Matt, thank you again for being here on the podcast with us. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you and thanks for giving us all this great insight into microphones. I learned a ton today. I really did not know how, you know, what the simple choices were. I'm really excited to have this graph and print it out and have it right in the studio so that I can see it and keep thinking about all this stuff. Rockstars, we are going to have, again, at the link rsrockstars.com slash mic locker. You can just click through. We're going to download the uh, the resource that Matt's talking about, the grid, and we'll add in content we're talking about on the show today and break it down for you. So it'll be a great way for you to make sure that you can effectively build and grow your mic locker by choosing complimentary microphones. Matt, thanks so much for joining us, man. It's been awesome to have you here on the show. Lidge, thanks for having me. It's been fun for me as well, and, and I hope useful for everybody else. All right, cheers, dude. I look forward to seeing you around. Uh, I don't know if I'll see you around the studio, but I'll see you around um, AES and NAM for sure. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Uh, awesome. Thanks, dude. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444, and I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.